who's the greatest philosopher ever? Plato's a leading contender. As the way things played out, he roughly laid out philosophy's whole agenda. The golden age of Athens shone less on Plato's generation, since even though it was the home of Western civilization, with the building blocks of democracy plus the Olympic Games, the occasional coup and rebellion threatened to bring it all down in flames. While some of his family were quite active on the political scene, young Plato got on with his studies. A bright lad, said one tutor, and keen. His nickname was Platon, a word meaning broad. The reason, well, plenty of guessed, it was either the broadness of his knowledge, forehead, shoulders, or chest. The brainy Greek with a strong physique was a wrestler in his youth, yet while fond of the gym, what really grabbed him was wrestling with the truth. Like many young people in Athens, in Plato the fire had been lit by Socrates in the market square, driving his fellow Athenians spare with his sharp examination of the lives they lived there and his even sharper wit. Socrates was a showman, but beyond that Plato saw, through the twists and turns of his arguments, he was aiming for so much more. Forget the entertainment. What Socrates tried to give was assistance to every Athenian in finding the best way to live. An educational, aspirational, confrontational programme of campaigning that galvanised young Plato, but Athens found too draining. The state execution of Socrates for the unwelcome guidance he gave was a bitter lesson for Plato in the way many humans behave. Hostile to those who question their thinking, defensive from cradle to grave. It echoes through his famous piece, The Allegory of the Cave. Picture a cave full of prisoners, in chains in a dark world of stone. Kept underground, limbs tightly bound, it's the only life they've ever known. A fire behind them, their only light, clamped by the neck, they can't move at all, unable to turn, the chains are too tight, staring at shadows on the cave wall. Now imagine that we are those prisoners, eyes glued to the wall night and day. Shadows inspire every thought that we think, inform every word that we say. This shadow world, this is reality. Life can be no other way. Then, all of a sudden, one prisoner shakes off his chains and breaks free. He turns, his eyes stung by the fire, but as they adjust, he can see strange objects. They cast all the shadows, and beyond them, a glimmer of light at the mouth of the cave. So he makes his way out. What a world! What a dazzling sight! The power of the sun, a radiant force for good. In the light of reason, so much more is understood. Exhilarating colours, wonders waiting to be found. A life to live beyond that grim existence underground. But then, when he staggers back into the cave to share this sensational news, out there is a light that will change your lives. Break these chains, you've got nothing to lose. The believers in shadows feel only fear, scream at the madman not to come near, attack him for threatening all they hold dear and disturbing their set-in-stone views. And that's the reception some thinkers get, like the one young Plato admired, though when Athens silenced Socrates, his pupil ensured it backfired. If Socrates the man in the flesh could not be heard, Plato promised Socrates the voice the final word. Plato's Socratic dialogues all share a similar plot. There's an unsuspecting character who thinks he knows quite a lot. Then Socrates asks him questions which begin to cast some doubt as to whether or not this confident man knows what he's talking about. You say you believe in justice, but how do you know what is right? You say you know what courage is. Is it always courageous to fight? The more that Socrates probes, the more the know-all stumbles, until he reaches a point where his self-assurance crumbles. 
Does each dialogue end with an answer? No, but that's not what counts. As a topic slowly unravels, an appreciation mounts of difficulties and nuances that hadn't been noticed before. The point is to follow the process and learn just a little bit more. A situation Plato must have witnessed many a time. Socrates deep in argument, before it was deemed a crime. For Plato, the death of Socrates was a life-changing event. He had almost gone into politics due to his aristocratic descent. His uncle was part of the tyranny, a system that self-combusted. But now what he'd seen of democracy left Plato, in his word, disgusted. So he quit the city of Athens and took an extended cruise, writing his dialogues all the while, lastly in Syracuse. Of the politics he observed in Sicily, one thought predominates. The rule of self-centred banquet lovers does not make for happy states. Returning to Athens some 15 years after his friend's execution, Plato launched a brand new educational institution, named after a place that honoured a hero from centuries before, so the name Academus lives on today in a way his fans never foresaw. As Plato realised his dream, in the olive groves of Academe. The academy was meant to be, in theory, a broad church dedicated to instruction, learning and research. One or two women did attend, but such was the state of equality then, the majority of those involved were aristocratic men. There was no specific curriculum, no courses like a college, but a looser arrangement of like-minded souls, all keen to expand human knowledge. An informal sharing of theories, with a lecture once in a while, and dialogues galore, safe to assume in a largely Socratic style. The academy was the perfect gym for mental acrobatics, but by far the most dominant discipline was the art of mathematics. There's even an ancient story, therefore open to conjecture, that Plato once delivered an extremely boring lecture which baffled his public audience as none of them understood why he used so much mathematics to explain the meaning of good. That maths plays a role in the universe was a groundbreaking observation by Pythagoras, who, with Socrates, was Plato's main inspiration. The natural world may seem random and chaotic at first glance, but according to the argument that Plato was keen to advance, nature is rooted in certain designs, geometrical patterns, proportions and lines that can't all be down to chance. Which is why the best mathematicians around had an open invitation to come and join the Academy's scientific investigation. This also explains the popular rumour that, with a dry professorial humour, a sign at the entrance of Plato's Academy said, don't come in if you don't know geometry. Plato's obsessive interest in mathematical solutions led to one of his own best-known philosophical contributions. The Platonic theory of perfect forms, ideals without physicality, offered grounds to believe that this world we perceive may not be the only reality. When we imagine a circle, a triangle or a square, it possesses a pure perfection, which in everyday life isn't there. In our direct experience, these perfect forms don't exist. But if each one of us is aware of them, how can this awareness persist? Plato's answer they do exist, in another perfect place, a world beyond our senses, a world without time or space. How do you know that a dog is a dog? A bone is a bone, a bed is a bed. Because perfect concepts of dogness and boneness and bedness exist in your head. The perfect form of a dog, the perfect form of a bone, of a bed, of a circle, triangle, square, Every object, everywhere, has a perfect form of its own. And goodness and beauty and truth and morality, ideals we can't quite define, have pure forms in Plato's alternate reality, a world that he called divine. We can picture that infinite, permanent realm where divine perfection lies, in contrast to living this life of decay where everything changes and dies. 
thanks to Plato's view of existence, two parallel worlds are now spliced, the beginnings of Christian thinking, hundreds of years before Christ. And as he explored his theory of forms, Plato created a role for the widely believed in, if yet to be proven, immortal, unchanging soul. Your indestructible soul, he proposed, is your earthly self's link to perfection. We're surrounded by imperfect versions of forms. The soul's memory makes the connection and recognises circularity in a mustard seed, identifies dogness, whatever the breed, and senses pure injustice in an evil deed. So now, at the heart of Platonic philosophy, there was one clear goal to rediscover through reason the ideals known to the soul. Shutting out external distractions, cutting out all sensual attraction, leaving the outside world behind, it's a soul-like separation of body and mind that leads to understanding. Which may be why he said, to practice philosophy is to practice being dead. Of all his works, the one that stands out for the greatest notoriety is Plato's Republic, the very first book to map out a perfect society. Many still consider it to be Plato's masterpiece, but for plenty of others it smacks of Big Brother and his army of thought police. In setting up his utopia, Plato argues the case that justice and reason in practice make the world a far better place. Just as we humans have passions which we need to rein in with good sense, so a government must employ reason to rule the multitude it represents. And who knows the most about reason, life, the universe, everything? Plato presents his dream ruler. Guess who? It's the philosopher king. To be fair, Plato knows that philosophers tend not to be practical types. What he means is that nobody's fit to rule till they've earned their scholarly stripes. He suggested preparing all statesmen and women with a very long education, 50 years of science, philosophy, politics, administration. But where should these leaders come from? To enhance their chance of succeeding, the best bet, in Plato's opinion, was a programme of forced controlled breeding. Plato proposed a noble lie to divide all the people by class by claiming the gods made three kinds of citizen, gold, silver and brass. With their parents selected in secret, the leaders would come from a pool of only those bred by the goldest of gold, quite literally born to rule. The silver population would perform a military role, enforcing the laws laid down by the gold to keep the brass under control. If this sounds totalitarian, it is. Only no one gets shot. It's a fantasy blueprint that Plato creates of how he would steer the great ship of state and guide all aboard to a happier fate, whether they like it or not. There's also bad news for artists. Plato wants them all banned as their works are dangerous distractions from the high-minded business at hand. Emotions and their glorification serve only to deflect from the thought and cool calculation that nurture the intellect. For Plato, poetry, drama, all art forms threaten our rational health. Though now his own work is seen as great literature, would Plato ban himself? Still, there's far more to Plato's Republic than an art-free fascist state. His rethink of politics highlights conundrums that never go out of date. Given what happened to Socrates, democracy is seen as flawed, and it's open to forces of tyranny which, for Plato, cannot be ignored. The people want freedom and liberty, a reasonable expectation, yet total and unfettered freedom is impossible within a nation. We know that when my liberties happen to clash with yours, a civilised society depends on rational laws. But if circumstances change, if we ever hit the stage where our capacity for reason is weaker than our rage, if chaos and disorder turn the state upon its head and fresh leadership's required, the people are sometimes misled. In the free-for-all of democracy, it's democracy that dies, when out of the fire events conspire for a new kind of ruler to rise. 
a man of the people, who crushes all debate by describing any rivals as enemies of the state. And as his power increases, he starts taking what he can, other people's property, other people's land. But the more he feeds his cravings, his lust for power unchecked, it isn't just the nation that is ultimately wrecked. The consequence of being unjust is never knowing who to trust. Neurotic, tragic, friendless, no dominance is endless. With insight, Plato writes about the tyrant's nerve-wracked soul, a slave to his own appetites and lack of self-control. It's often assumed that self-interest is reluctantly curbed by morality, but they are not opposites, Plato suggests, in a balanced and strong personality. It's rational good sense to avoid the descent to a soul-destroying quarrel. The moral of the Republic? It's in your self-interest to be moral. And what's true for the individual is equally true for a nation. It's the rule of reason and justice that creates a great civilization. Plato's the first philosopher whose writing largely survives, and for more than two millennia he's influenced all of our lives. His conviction that reason and patterns and purpose exist in nature's creations inspired the scientific research of future generations. For instance, Aristotle and all systems of classification. Copernicus and Galileo on planetary rotation. Dr William Harvey and the body's circulation. Anatomical, astronomical, even quantum mechanical. Every puzzle in nature feels worth investigating if your mindset is that somehow, somewhere, there's an answer waiting. Creating the Academy was another inspiration, an ancient Greek prototype of higher education. In all his lively dialogues, he pushed for clarification of concepts like justice and ethics and truth via rational examination. In Timaeus, it's the whole cosmos and the natural world's creation. Symposium, how platonic love soars above copulation. And with his lucid description of two distinct worlds, Plato prepared the ground for religious repercussions which, for good or ill, still resound. Even his allegory of the cave has contemporary overtones. If you see on the wall of shadows a web of mobile phones... So, was he the greatest philosopher? It's an unphilosophical question. Philosophy ought to be more than a sport, but, in line with one famous suggestion, if you're looking for a phrase to sum up Western thought concisely, it's all footnotes to Plato. Does the job quite nicely. <laughs>